Hello everyone, welcome to week six. We have just two more weeks to go. Um, the last week will be mostly yours for working on your final projects. I will do a video to sum up this week, um, but don't worry about a quiz or any readings because I really want you to finish those final wikis. But if you have any other questions um, or you need more examples, make sure you check out the ones that I've listed on Blackboard or just let me know and I can provide those. All right, before we get into the topics, as usual, we have a couple of housekeeping matters. First off, rough drafts for your conclusion are due on Wednesday. Give me as much or as little as you want. Make sure, though, that you're giving me part of your call to action. That's one of the things that I really want to focus on and make sure that you're doing. It's one of the things that really sets this project apart from other research papers you might do because I really want you to be thinking about the audience and thinking about ways that they can enhance what you're doing. And with those calls to action, make sure that you're asking for something that's specific and something that's factual. Also make sure that you include ways that they can contact you and submit that kind of information. There are two questions from the quiz this week that I wanted to spend a little bit of time on. And the first one, I'm giving you an extra point. Because one of the answers to the question, what is the best connection between anonymity and incivility that Reader found in his analysis of journalistic essays about online comment forums? The correct answer was Reader emphasized that the connection was not clear. But he also emphasized that incivil does not necessarily mean bad. And so I ended up giving you credit for that point. I think those are two important takeaways to get from that reading. The second question was about Domingo. And I asked again the best. In this case, there were a lot of really good answers. The question was, which of the following answers explains, as Domingo does, what kind of user-generated content is best for an editor to read? Yes, editors like content that could lead to a new story. They like content that challenges them. But most importantly, and he made a good point of this, they want factual content. And that's what the correct answer was there. And I think that's a good approach that we should apply as we look at how do we use content. Let's encourage our audiences to share factual content. Less opinions, less comments, more facts, because that makes our jobs more effective. When you really think about it and the time that you spend weighing through things and when people get mean and nasty, it's when they're just sharing opinions. So maybe if our focus is more on facts, we can mitigate some of that problem. Each week I start off with an example that underscores the message of the readings. And this week, while I'm at C-SPAN, I thought there was no better example to start with than C-SPAN, because they're trying really hard to integrate their audience and use audience comments. What's unique about C-SPAN is they have such a distinct philosophy. They were created by the cable industry as a public service to bring unbiased coverage of the House and the Senate and other historical and factual things to the audience. Even on their programs, such as Washington Journal, where they take audience calls, the hosts maintain a strict impartiality. I've seen that in play while I've been here. It's been really interesting to me because our natural inclination is to comment on that or to share our own opinions. Here they can't. You might think that hamstrings them a little bit as they seek audience comment. Um, but one of the things that I've found as I've worked on these shows and interacted with people is the importance of culture. And I've seen that culture evident here. You don't have to be trained in what C-SPAN is. You don't have to be trained on which comments to use or how not to include your opinion. But it's just so endemic in the system that the employees act upon it without really even thinking. And I think the audience notices too. I think the person who's going to call into Morning Journal or call into another one of C-SPAN shows or even create clips on C-SPAN's website understands that they're looking for unbiased truth rather than lots of opinions and commentary. And just to show you some examples of how they translate that philosophy into their social media accounts, here's a typical tweet from C-SPAN. This next one comes from their Capitol Hill correspondent. He was waiting to cover Congress when he noticed that President Obama made a surprise appearance. And instead of saying, oh, what a surprise appearance, this is what he put instead. I like how he used a direct quote from Obama, still conveyed kind of the surprise of the event without actually having to say it. It's one of the key lessons that we emphasize in beginning news writing about what makes journalism different from other forms of writing. They also use social media to have a little bit of fun, even within the tight, unbiased constraints that they've set for themselves. Here's an example of Seersucker Thursday. So now let's get to your comments. Uh, I thought you had some really interesting things to say about how reporters digest all of this. And I think that's really important because the goal and the focus of this reading was practice. How do we apply some of these theories to what we're really trying to do as reporters. One of you summarized the reporter's problem really well. Reporters need to reflect reality. 
That's part of our job, and that needs to show in our policies on story comments. Readers need to be able to duke it out a bit. Yes, we should remove spam and hateful content, but if we're writing a story about abortion or gay marriage, our comment sections will reflect the divisiveness of these issues. I like that comment because in issues like this that are divisive, you know, we always talk about covering both sides, or even talking about you know, going beyond the two sides and seeing what the, the real concerns and the real opinions of our audience is. Can comments be any better way to do that? A few of you share some real practical tips on how to make that a reality and how to get the most out of comments. A good way to handle the actual viewing of the facts and our opinion in anonymous commenting would be to initially hide the comments. At the end of an article, there could be a tab that reads, click here to view comments, or something of the sort. That way, comments can be submitted and viewed if desired. I know I have seen it a little bit before, but I think it could work for all news websites. It's not something I had really thought about, but I think it's a really good idea, and it really gives that opportunity to the audience that's going to be most engaged in comments. They'll have to actually click and decide that they're going to view those. A lot of you talked about community managers and if that's a practical avenue for most newsrooms. One of you even shared in the discussion board about his current internship and how reporters aren't expected to go through comments, even though some stories get a thousand comments a day. And while I like Paulson's discussion of the BBC, and I like what the BBC is doing, I agree that it's not practical. And I agree that the best case scenario is for the reporters to be actively involved in the comments that appear at the end of their stories. But here's another one of your takes on it. Yes, this position may lighten the load for a busy journalist. It shouldn't, however, recreate the wheel by allowing a writer to dodge the discourse that follows an inventive or controversial story. What about the journalists themselves? If the writer of the story cannot fathom reading and responding to comments on their own work, they should reconsider their career choice. That's a pretty strong statement, um, but I agree. You know, this is something that we need to get more involved in. And I think one of the reasons that journalists lost connection to their audience is they weren't open to comments and online forums uh, initially. Another way that you really underscored this statement. Only a journalist can sort through what is newsworthy and what piques their interest to generate a story. By reading the background and source of the content, they already have a leg up, and it would save reporting time rather than having a moderator print the background and source information, pass it along to the journalist, and then having the journalist review it and decide if it is a story. I really like this comment because that's one of the things that we see as a big hang-up, that we just don't have the time. But honestly, a reporter with the background already has more time and would take less time with these comments than a community manager who doesn't know the story as well. I think this is also helps us to, to determine the worth and the value of comments. You know, if we know the story, if we know what's really going on, we can easily say this is a good comment or this is something that we need to discard. For the last set of readings, I've tentatively called it the future because we look at two instances where technology is having big impacts on how we consume information. First off, Sherry Turkle in her book, Alone Together, talks about what is the proper way to use technology within our social lives, and asks some really important questions of, does this have to be an all one or the other? Is it all technology or is it no technology? I think she really makes a good case for finding a balance between the two things. And in Consent of the Network, Rebecca McKinnon builds upon some of the things that we read about in the book, Cached, about how culture informs our use of technology but also how we need to be involved in the spread of technology to ensure that technology serves our purposes and not the purposes of someone else. I hope you find these readings interesting. And the case study for next week has to do with a little thing called Jibo, J-I-B-O. If you want to look it up before next week, if you have some time, which you probably won't, but I'll throw it out there anyway, you might want to check it out. All right, well, that's all that I have for this week. Uh, thanks again for watching. Thanks again for all your hard work in the class. I really enjoyed being part of the class and making these videos. And again, if you have any questions or comments, please let me know. Thanks, and I'll see you back in Athens next week.